morning. It's so good to see y'all. I think we're supposed to stand and, sh stand and shout to the Lord. Correct? Are we supposed to shout to the Lord? I think so. I don't know. <laughs> With a shout to the Lord. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, Sunday in Advent, and we're going to continue our hymns of praise singing, His Name is Wonderful. So join with me in singing, His Name is Wonderful. <coughs> Jesus. 
Welcome to Bethlehem. I'm so glad you chose to come here this morning to worship with us in the house of the Lord. If you're a guest, we welcome you also. If I can remind you to sign in your pew pads and to write in your address, that would be great. And that would help us staff to, to be able to give cards and see all of your smiling faces when we want to visit you. But um, thank you for being here. Uh, just a couple of announcements to lift up to you. Um, today is the deadline for the poinsettia order and for the youth fundraiser of the, um, of the um, candles, the, la- the lights of love. Thank you so much. Uh, the lights of love. Today is the deadline. So if you want to purchase a light of love to help the youth raise money, uh, or if you want to purchase a poinsettia, then uh, you can do that today. Um, also, too, I know that we ask a lot of you when it comes to the Lambs and Stars and donating to Storehouse for Jesus, but there's 13 churches that are coming together. They're called the Advanced 13. That's what we named ourselves. And we want to come together as a body of Christ, a bigger body of Christ, and be able to hand in uh, items of canned goods and non-perishable items or toiletries or diapers or, or formula or toilet paper or anything of that nature. And we'd like you to collect it and bring it on December 21st. Um, just bring in two cans or bring in a little, just a little grocery bag or of food. Uh, we want to be able to replenish the shelves for Storehouse for Jesus after Christmas because we feel that they're going to be pretty empty. So we want to be able to do that for them because everybody's donating now to Storehouse for Jesus so they can hand out for Christmas. But our goal is to replenish those shelves so they have enough food for the families in January. So our goal by December 21st is to have you all bring it on that date. So mark it on your calendars. And our goal is to at least take a truckload. I like to take more, but I'm not, trying, I'm not asking for a lot, just a truckload. So if y'all can gather together and bring that, that would be wonderful. I would just love that. Um, keep up with the announcements. Keep up with the events in your bulletin. Please read your bulletin. There's lots going on with different uh, Sunday school classes having their Christmas party, and I think the seniors are also having their Christmas party. So just uh, keep yourself aware of what's going on in the bulletin. Is there any other announcements? I have an announcement. Next Sunday night is our last Sunday night to feed at the fest. Thank you, Jimmy. It is a great ministry that uh, we have here, and um, since it is going to be our last Sunday to do that, it would be a great, um, if you have the time to, to take, to be with the homeless um, on that Sunday. Donna? Just to remind everybody that if you are sponsoring a lamb or a star, they're due next Sunday. I have to take them the following week, so please try to have them back. If for any reason you did not get a plastic bag, I had run it. I ran out of bags, so I have more bags. So just see me after church, and I'll be glad. They ask that they be in clear plastic bags for the children. The adult can be wrapped, but for the children. Also, if you um, got uh, the, one of the red pieces of paper with our <coughs> our special members to send birthday cards, uh, Christmas cards to us, we we've updated that list. 
We added Christine Miller to that list. She was inadvertently left off. It is corrected on the new list if you get one out of the mission room or out of the vestibule today, or it's also corrected in the newsletter. Darn, um, the computer had it wrong, not us. The computer had it listed as her, her birthday, her birth year is 1935, but we all know she just celebrated her big party for her 80th birthday, so don't leave her off. Thank you, Donna. Is there any other announcements, Perry? Thank you, Perry. Is there any other? Flora. If the kids in here will listen very carefully to the line of Advent reading, we're going to talk about it during the children's time. Is there any other announcements? Yes. Virginia. We're looking for bell ringers for Saturday, December the 20th. Um, it's going to be a Harris Peter Tangle. They've changed their location for Food Lion to Harris Senior now. From 10 to 7 30, she might like to ring the bell for Salvation Army. Is there any other announcements? Okay, what last one? <laughs> Thank you, James. Jonathan Ellis is our lay reader this morning. He'll be opening us up with prayer. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Um, I ate so much, I really need to take another nap right now. <laughs> but it's getting there. Now let's pray, please. Thank you, God, for the gifts of life today. We give thanks that your face shines upon us. For you are a salvation. Lead us like a shepherd. Strengthen us for whatever lies ahead. Grant us the spiritual gifts of peace, kindness, patience, and gentleness. For we want to show your love in word and deed to others. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Uh, today is our first Sunday of Advent, and Advent uh, for our first Sunday is hope, and hope is in the anticipation of our Lord and Jesus Christ coming down to earth, and the Pe uh, Knuckles family will light this candle, Chris, Peggy, Richard, and Ryan. <coughs> In days to come, to the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Isaiah 2.2 2. We begin the first week of Advent with hope in God's promised arrival. A favorite Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, reflects the hope we celebrate today. The hymn's sixth verse speaks of hope. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thy advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. As we light the first candle of Advent, we carry into our gloomy places the light of hope.
Let us pray. Lord of hope, we await your coming with great expectations. Our lives are marked by hope even when our circumstances might prove to the contrary. May we put to flight the dark shadows of others this Advent season. Amen. I think it's time for our children to come forward. Even have my microphone. She said the Advent read. That is exactly right. Good listening. Here you go. All right. Now, you had a chance to answer a question, so now we'll let others have a chance. Okay. Is today, you're going to raise your hand if you know the answer, is today the first, second, third, or fourth Sunday in Advent? <laughs> Richard has an advantage. The first. The first. That's exactly right. It's the first Sunday in Advent. You're welcome. Okay, now, Richard and Ryan and his mom and dad lit one candle. Do you remember what the name of that candle is? Oh, this one now. Hope. Hope, that's exactly right. I'm so glad everybody was listening. The hope candle, okay. Now, Advent means to come in Latin, and Christmas is coming. Does anybody know how many days it is till Christmas? Oh. Uh. <laughs> 25? 25. That's exactly <laughs> right. 25 days. And if you have watched TV or gone to the stores, you know Christmas is coming. Anybody go shopping this past weekend? Mm-hmm. And you know those commercials are saying, go out and buy. We've got sales. And they're flashing on so fast, toys and clothes, you can hardly see everything. And then when you go in the stores, there's noise and the Christmas trees and lights and those big inflatable Santa Claus and Frosty the Snowman. And, it, you know, it, Christmas is coming. You can't miss it. But, you know, the Advent wreath is very simple. It's just a round circle, a wreath is a round circle, five candles, but it tells us Christmas is coming too. And I think it's a very quiet, peaceful way. Because you know, when you light a candle, isn't it kind of quiet? Mm -hmm. Lots of times if, you, if your power goes out, you light a candle and it's quiet because the TV's not on, the computer's not on. And so it is a very peaceful, quiet way to tell us that Christmas is coming. And we're celebrating Christmas, Jesus being born, to give us hope, like the hope candle that Richard and Ryan and their family lit. So it's, it's great to be excited about Christmas and going to the stores and Santa Claus coming, but also the Advent wreath, because we're going to light a candle every Sunday, reminds us in a very quiet way that Christmas is coming to give us hope. Okay? All right. Good job. Children's Church. Does anybody have any joys and concerns they would like to lift up this morning? Everybody good? No joys? I have a joy that we're going to have a cantata 
Okay. The choir? Y'all hello? Okay, okay. I heard y'all talking, so I didn't know. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this special time of year and the anticipation of your Lord and Savior coming here to this earth, Lord, as a baby. Lord, this is a grand time and a grand uh, event of joy and peace, Lord, and happiness. Lord, we thank you for giving the gift to the choir and to all the people that sing in our cantata because it's just a beautiful moment. It's like a little tiny sliver piece of heaven, Lord, and it's so majestic and great. Lord, there is so much on our hearts to lift up, but Lord, we lock them in our hearts this morning and we keep them unspoken. But Lord, you know what's in our hearts. You know what's in our minds and you know what's, what's eating at us and what's bothering us and what we're happy about and what we're concerned about and what we're worried about, Lord. And you are the all-knowing God and you know everything about us. We thank you, Lord, for being in a country that is free to be able to freely worship you in this house this morning. We don't have to hide our religion and our, our, our worshiping, Lord, and our Christianity. Lord, we just ask that you be with uh, the Operation Christmas Child Ministry, Lord, and you give them the courage to be able to go into those countries, Lord, and you always make the pathway for them, Lord. And we thank you for, 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 for being with everybody who does that, Lord. Lord, and you taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
great what yeah it'd be great if y'all want to come down and see uh the altar that's coming out you all can um the scripture reading today is going to be first kings chapter 18 verses 16 through 40 um if you open up your bibles that'd be great in your your pew bibles to open it up um i won't be reading you the scripture reading because it's going to be very long and i don't want to bore you to death so when i go through it in the sermon then you can follow along then. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Our story begins this morning in a royal palace in the capital city of Samaria, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom as we know it, in the year 874 B.C., that is the first year of the reign of King Ahab. Now, King Ahab is an evil king. It teaches us in the Bible, it says that King Ahab did the most evil things in the eyes of the Lord, and he also provoked the Lord to anger the most than any other king before him. On top of that, though, he marries Queen Jezebel. Okay, now Queen Jezebel is the most evil woman in the Bible. She is very evil. Now, her father is King Etenbel. He is the king of the Sidonians and at the Phoenician states up north of Samaria. Now, he is a Baal worshiper. He's actually a priest of the Baal of God, the, the Baal of God. So Jezebel follows in her father's footsteps and she becomes a devout Baal and Ashtoreth worshiper. Now the Baal God is this alpha male God, okay? He's the alpha male. His name Baal means master or Lord. Now he is the God of bountiful harvest. He's the God of rains and he's also the God of agriculture, now, as Taurus, she's the alpha queen. She's the alpha mother goddess. She is the god of fertility and sexuality. That's what she's the god of. And Jezebel worshiped the god of Baal and as or Azure. And she was such a devout worshiper that when she married King Ahab, she brought her religion or her gods down into the kingdom of Israel. And by doing this, she had such a, a control over Ahab that she got Ahab into worshiping the Baal gods. And he, she got Ahab so far into worshiping the Baal gods that King Ahab built a temple and an altar just for the Baal of God. Well, you know, if you've got a temple and an altar for the Baal of God, they're doing their sin offerings and all this other things. So the kingdom of Israel, the people, are going to start worshiping this Baal God, her religion, which she was devoted to. And besides that, she has control over 850 priests of Baal. She controls 850 men. 
850 men. And then, so by doing this, Israel, the kingdom of Israel, went down in a spiral downfall, a destruction, if you will, of moral and spirituality. The one true God, no, no, said, no, no, we can't have this. My people are going away. I want my people's hearts back. So I'm going to send the great prophet Elijah, who has faith and courage to be able to confront the evil king Ahab. And so he does. He goes to King Ahab in the royal palace, and he says this. King Ahab, the Lord of Israel, the God that lives, the living God, not the one that you worship, not this false God who who doesn't have a heart or anything like that, the Lord that lives, that I serve, whom I serve, not what you serve, but who I serve. It's not going to give you any dew or rain for the next few years until the Lord says so, until you have his word. Now, you know, the Bible doesn't really specify how King Ahab felt. So I really don't know, but I can just imagine that he was maybe, you know, tiptoeing on, you know, still believing in his gods because, you know, the king god of Baal was for rains and bountiful harvests. Or he could have been tiptoeing on the, you know, you know just... You know, he just didn't like the message. You know, because when we go through the story, you'll find that he he wants to look for Elijah. Elijah becomes his enemy. I don't know if it's just like, you know, when I get bad news, you know, it takes a while for it to resonate with me. You know, it takes like 24 hours for me to kind of absorb bad news. You know, it's bad for my family because I'm all happy the day I get the bad news. And then the next day I'm like, whoa, this ain't happening. You know, this is bad news. I am mad. And I think that's what happened with King Ahab. It just took that time to resonate with him. But no, no, you know, we got Jezebel. Jezebel, man, she did some quick action. Because when she heard the message, there was no way anybody was going to get in in the middle of this. And there was no way nobody was going to tell her, the spoiled queen, what she was going to do. Because she didn't care who died and who had to sacrifice for what she wanted, the idol of me the God of me, she was going to get what she wanted. So she wasn't going to care about this message. She didn't want that to get out to the Israelites. So what she decides to do is she decides to kill all the prophets of the Lord. Now, you know, Elijah wasn't the only prophet in the Bible. There's lots of other prophets, but there was hundreds of prophets of the Lord that told the message to the people and to the king. And Jezebel knew that. So she went out and she slaughtered prophets of the Lord. But yet there was a man named Obadiah. And Obadiah, he's the second in command in the royal palace. He's underneath King Ahab. But he was also a true God follower. You know, he was kind of in the middle. He worked for this horrible, horrible boss who did these evil things, and he probably did evil things too because he he didn't do what his boss told him to do. But yet, he was in the middle because he worshipped the Lord. He believed in the one true God because what he did was he took a hundred of the Lord's prophets and he hid them in caves and he provided them with food and water. Now, how did he do this? Well, he did it with the Lord. You know, the Lord's going to provide for us when he has a job for us to do. He's going to provide what we need. And sure enough, he provided because you know if there's no rain, there's no crops. If there's no crops, there's no food. And if there's no food, then people are going to starve. People are going to die. Livestock is going to die. There's nothing. But yet, through the three-year famine... Obadiah was able to feed the faithful Lord's prophets of the Lord food and water. And as his three years was going on, the Lord, God of Israel, told King e- or t- told Prophet Elijah that it was time for him to come back. Now, during this time, he told Prophet the Prophet Elijah to hide. So Elijah's been hiding for three years. First, he was at a ravine, and then when that brook dried up, he went to the Phoenician states. So he was several miles away from Samaria. 
But now it's time because the Lord said, it's time to give King Ahab a message. And you know, the prophet Elijah, he didn't flinch. He was faithful and courageous. He just went. He walked his several miles down. And you know, if, if God has a plan for us, we don't always know it now, but God will open up the doors for us and we'll be able to see what we, what we need to do. It becomes clear. And it became clear to Elijah as he's getting into Samaria, lo and behold, who does he see? He sees Obadiah. Well, what's Obadiah doing out there? Well, Obadiah, he's looking for grass because King Ahab instructed him and told him and said, listen, we need to find some grass, okay? We need to find some grass down by the valleys and, and, the, and the streams because I got to feed my livestock. You know, I worship this God that cares about agriculture and I don't want to slay my animals. Forget about the people who are dying. We, I don't care about all that. You know, they can starve. I need to take care of my animals. So Obadiah does exactly what what, what the king says. Obadiah didn't go and say, hey, king, you know, don't you care about these people? Don't you care about the dying people? No, he went off and did what he was told. So guess what? Obadiah sees Elijah, and Obadiah says, he recognizes him, and Obadiah says, is it really you, Lord Elijah? And Elijah says, yes, it is me. And I need for you to tell the king that I have a message for him. Oh, no, 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 no. You're crazy. There's no way I'm going to tell the king that you have a message, that you're here. No way. He's going to find out that I worship the Lord. There's no way that that's going to happen. You know why? Because do you know that while you were gone for three years, King Ahab was looking at every nation and talking to every king to find out where you were? And he made the king swear that he, they did not see you. And you want me now to go? No, I'm not doing that. So, so Elijah says, yes, yes, you are. I have a message for King Ahab. No, 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 Obadiah says, there's no way. What happens if the Holy Spirit or the Lord of the Spirit tells you to go away? I'm going to be left here in front of King Ahab, and you're not even going to be around. He's going to kill me if he knows that I worship the Lord, that I know the Lord. And guess what, buddy? Guess what? You know what? While you were hiding three years, do you know I've been worshiping the Lord since I was a youth? And while you were hiding, do you know what I did? I hid a hundred false prophets, and I provided them with food and water. That's what I did while you were gone and hiding. What do you think about that? Do you hear the I in there? You don't hear the Lord. The Lord helped him get the food and water. The Lord helped him with the providing of the caves. You know, he forgot about all that. That's the God of I, God of me. I did it. Give me the credit. No, it doesn't work that way. And Elijah said, no way, because guess what? Whom I serve, whom I serve. I don't know what you're serving because you're kind of like in the middle. You're serving your, yourself, and you're serving King Ahab, but you're not serving the Lord, okay? I know who I'm serving. I'm telling you today, you're going to, I'm going to see King Ahab. And that's where we will pick up in verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and old and told him, and Ahab met, went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to them, Is that you, troubler of Israel? Look what you did. Look what your message caused. Your God caused this. People are dying. Even though I'm getting grass for animals, people are dying. This is what you did. Don't you know that, you know, when, when, we, when we do something wrong, we like to blame people. We like to blame the messenger. You know, when they came up that saying, Don't shoot the messenger. Well, that's why. Because when we get bad news, the first person that we look at is the person that gave us the bad news. We blame them. And that's what King Ahab is doing. He's blaming Elijah. He's the messenger of bad news. And King Ahab isn't going to take accountability that his disobedience was the one that's causing this moral decline and spiritual decline with his people. So this is what Elijah says. He says, I have not made trouble for Israel. Elijah replied, but you and your father's family, have you abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals? 
You know, back in Moses' day when he had the Ten Commandments, when he brought it down to Mount, from Mount Sinai, he says the first commandment is you will have no other gods before me. The second commandment is, is that you will not make any form or worship any idol. So you and your family have gotten these Israelites, God's people, to worship this, your Baal, your Ashtoreth. Now, summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Azure who eat at Jezebel's table. 850 false prophets, the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth, are eating at Jezebel's table. You know why they're eating at Jezebel's table? Because she, they're telling her what she wants to hear. She's beautiful. She's grand. She's great. Oh, this and that. that that's why she's there. They're, they're telling her these are what false prophets do. They tell people what they want to hear. And they're untruths. They're not the truth. And do you know these false prophets get paid by, by Queen Jezebel? So they're making money off of her. They're becoming wealthy. That's the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet. A true prophet, follower of God, is going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not. They're going to tell you the message whether you become unpopular or not. And they're going to tell you the truth and they're not going to have these big million dollar homes. That's the pastor's job. The pastor's job is to be able to tell you the message whether you like me or not. And to be able not to make money off of it but to live within our means. And it's your job as the body of Christ to go out and tell the message of the Lord, the truth, because then you become a false prophet if you don't tell the truth, whether you're unpopular or not. So anyways, so Ahab sent word throughout Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long have you wavered between two opinions? If it's God you want, then follow him. If it's Baal you want, then follow him. You can't go in the middle. You can't bounce back and forth. You can't serve two masters. That's what Jesus says. You can't do that. So what is it going to be? Guess what? The people said nothing. They couldn't. They couldn't say anything. They didn't have any faith. They wanted to show some proof. They didn't know what to do. They were confused. It seemed like they were confused. If you don't say anything, you seem confused. Who do we follow? I don't know. So then it says, then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. I'm the only one left. He's not going to tell, you know, the people about the hundred prophets that are in hiding because, you know, Jezebel's going to get on her horse and chariot and she's going to go find them and she's going to start slaughtering them. So he says, I'm the only prophet left. And he protects the hundred prophets in hiding. And then he says, but Baal has 450 prophets so get two bulls for us and let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you can call the name of your God and I'll call the name of the Lord and whoever answers is God by fire. Whoever answers by fire is God. What do y'all think? Y'all think that's good? We could do the battle of the gods here right now. The battle of the gods. That's what he told the people. Let's do it. Let's get it on. So then all the people say, so all the people say, hey, it's good to us. Go for it. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Okay, there's 850 of these people. Okay, Elijah, you know, these people are liars. They tell untruths. He wants to make sure that they're not going to fake him out, you know, and set the fire or try to set the fire or, you know, try to be, you know, get the fire up so he could prove to the people that this is a living God, this Baal, these idols. So he goes, since there's so many of you, I can't keep track of y'all. You guys go first. Okay, there's only one of me. So call in the name of your God, but do not light that fire. So they took the bull, given them, and they prepared it. And then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. 
Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around this altar. There was no response, no answer. Could you imagine? Could you imagine serving a living God that gave you no response and no answer? Of course he's going to do no response and no answer for the false gods, the God of Baal. You know, he had three years to answer, right? He's the God of rains. He's the God of bountiful harvests. Why didn't he answer then? Do you think he's going to answer now? No. But aren't you glad that we can serve a living God that will answer us? May not be in our, in our time frame that we want him, but he's going to answer us. Aren't you glad that we have a living God that we can go to? Amen on that? Amen. So then at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. He thought that this was comical, that they're idolizing and worshiping this God of Baal, this non, non-living God. So he says, shout louder. Surely he's your God. Shout louder. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or or traveling. And in some Bibles, it says that he's gone to the bathroom. He's defecating. I mean, where is your God? Is he meditating? Should we wake him up? Isn't it great that we can serve a God that we don't have to wake up, that doesn't go to the bathroom, that is going to be with us no matter what? No matter what, the living God never sleeps And he answers with our prayers. So they shout louder and they slash themselves with swords and spirits, as was their custom. They're getting desperate, so they're slashing themselves and they're bleeding on this altar. And you know, we can take that into today's context. We slash ourselves when we worship these idols, like the God of family. We slash ourselves because we're so desperate to see our children do something in their lives. We want our children. We put all this pressure on them. We put our pressure on our spouse. When I want my spouse to fix the truck engine that cost us $11,000, when he told me that, I said, I said, hon, uh, man, can't you fix it? You know, the God of me is saying, oh my gosh, it's a lot of money. You know, the God of money is in me and the God of me is in me. And then I've got my husband on the pedestal saying, oh Lord, I know you could do it, honey. And he's telling me, you know, I don't have the tools. And I'm like, oh, Lord, let's just buy the tools. And he's saying, hon, by the time you buy the tools, I'm going to spend a week on this truck, and we're not going to get any production. And I'm like, oh, Lord. And I'm cutting myself. Not really, but you know what I mean. And I'm so desperate. And that's what I'm trying to tell you, that when we get these gods in our heart, we get so desperate to have them. The God of me, we need power and success. And we want money, and we want luxury vehicles, and we want these big houses. And we get so desperate that for no unknown reason, for all, For any cause, our family sacrificed for that. We sacrificed people to get where we want. So they're slashing themselves because they're desperate. So the midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response and no answer. No one paid attention over there. Aren't you glad that we have a living God? that pays attention to us, that pays attention, that says that we are special in his eye, that we are the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. He pays attention to us. Then Elijah said, come on, people, come on over here. So they came here, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. You know, they pushed the Lord away, so this altar wasn't being used. And then Elijah just took 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says, you are Israel. You are family. And we work together. That's like us. Every rock in here is different because we're all different. We have all different gifts and we have all different personalities. But when we work together as one, the body of Christ, God's message gets out among the world, our communities, our families, everywhere. So he said, let's bind together and get together. So then he took the 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the Lord of, word of the Lord should be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seeds of, or two Saharas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering in the wood. And so they did. 
the jar of water, the Lord's living water. And then Elijah said, do it again. And so they did. Elijah poured water on the altar to show them that he wasn't the one who's going to be starting the fire. And then Elijah said, do it again, because in the Jewish custom, if you say something three times, it becomes a contract, and it seals the deal. The Lord and his purifying water purifies us. And then Elijah said, after they did this, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. He says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back. And then the fire, oh Lord, oh Lord, light my fire. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned upon the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also looked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and they cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley, and he slaughtered all the false prophets. Slaughtered them. All the false prophets. What gods here do we need to slaughter? Do we need to slaughter the the God of food or the God of achievement or the God of intelligence or the God of perfectionism or the God of entertainment, the God of romance, the God of family, the God of me? What idols here this morning do we have to slaughter? Because, you know, these gods are actually gifts from God. They're actually gifts given to us. I mean, it's okay to have these gifts, but the problem is is that when we turn them into idols, when they become most important, and the bottom line I'm going to tell you is when we love these more than the living God. You love these, we love these more than the living God. And these gods, they fight within our hearts, and we have to try to dethrone them. It's a daily process. It's not something you could just remove the trash. You can't. If you have the God of food and you're trying to, you know, and, and this um, is a comfort food to you, and when you have a bad day at work and you're going in the fridge and you're getting out that ice cream, you're eating the whole pint, I mean, you can't just go and get your exercise bike out that's removing the garbage. You, there's something deeper. There's a reason why. There's a reason why Jezebel worshipped Baal, and that was because of her fathers, and sometimes we follow what our parents do. And that's the cycle that we have to break. There's more to it than just having the God of money. There's an issue. It's a heart issue. It's a disease of the heart. And by prayer and seeking God out, we can dethrone these gods on a daily basis. And when we dethrone these gods on a daily basis, God is here to pick us up. Right? God is here to pick us up. What are we going to choose? What are y'all going to choose? Are you going to choose those gods that don't satisfy us, that leave us empty without joy? Or are we going to serve the living God who gives us hope and joy and security and comfort? You know, Joshua said to his people that they had to choose And he said, it's for me and my house. I am going to serve the Lord. What are y'all going to do? Can you stand with me and say, I am going to serve the Lord? Would you be able to do that today and say, I want to serve the Lord? I love him more than anything in this world. And that's your challenge this week, is try to dethrone and be aware of the gods in your life that cover up your heart, that take you away from our Lord and Savior. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for bringing your son to this earth, Lord, and, and teaching us how to live as Christians and then dying on the cross for our sins and paying our penalty of death and giving us the gift of eternal life. Lord, we thank you for all this, and we ask that you touch our heart, Lord, and you teach us to be aware of those gods that, hide, that, that take over our heart where you aren't able to shine. And Lord, we thank you for being in our lives and within us. And in Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, I surrender all, the altar is open for you to pray and to lay your gods at the altar. Let us stand and sing. the peace of love and reconciliation. <laughs> that was awesome, hun. That's really awesome.
God has enriched us in every way, in speech, knowledge, and spiritual gifts. From the fellowship of Jesus Christ, we are sent out to share with thanksgiving what we have received. Will the ushers please come forward to receive God's gifts and offerings. Faithful God, we thank you that Christ is being revealed in every time and place. Until he comes in fullness of glory, strengthen our testimony and spiritual gifts. Increase generosity in us, we pray, as we wait for the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
want to let you know that the idols that you've seen came from this Bible study, Gods at War, by Kyle Eidelman. Just want to give him the credit for all the idols that you've seen on the altar today. If you're interested in this Bible study, let me know, and maybe we could, we could do it as a church. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.